I'm Taylor. I'm Kat. And welcome to another Halloween bonus episode. Hi. Spooky Halloween. So today we are tackling our oldest case so far, but possibly the oldest case that we're ever going to do, just by the nature of how fucking old this is. Uh, (laughs) And... Today, we're going to tell you the story of one of the world's first ever serial killers in recorded history, at the very least. There may be others, but we don't know them. Probably is. Yeah. Now, we were going to do this for one of our ancient serial killer episodes in August, but we realized quickly that um, there isn't really enough information out there to do a full-length episode about it. Uh, so is this a, just a, a wee a wee little short guy, basically. So uh, let's head off to China in the second century BC with the story of Lu Pengli and quite possibly some tangents from Kat about the time that she lived in China. Uh, Lu Pengli was born sometime in the second century BC into the Han Dynasty. We don't know the year he was born, but we do know that his father Lu Wu. Prince of Liang lived between uh, 184 and 144 BC. So we can presume he was born sometime after the uh, 160 BC. Yeah. I get confused because it goes backwards. backwards. (laughs) Yeah. Don't worry. I've probably got some of the dates the wrong (laughs) way around. (laughs) Pengli's uncle, Emperor Jing ruled from 170 uh, no 157 to 141 BC and at this time in Chinese history the capital was the city of Chang'an in central China which today is called Xi'an uh, famous in part for the terracotta warriors oh. Chang'an was one of the four ancient capitals the other three being Luo Luoyang Luoyang yes I'm going to get my <laughs> get my vowels the right way around Luoyang, uh, Beijing, now Beijing literally translates to northern capital, and Nanjing, which translates to southern capital. Very appropriately named. Yes, and that's where I spent a summer, 10 years ago. I like to say I lived there because it makes me sound interesting, (laughs) when really I had friends who lived there and I had the summer off from uni and saved up my student loans all year to go spend like two months out there. I mean... Like, we've discussed this before. If you're visiting a place and you have to go to the grocery store, like, more than three times, I feel like (laughs) that means you live there. Okay. So, as long as you hit that barrier, I think that's legit. (laughs) In that case, I also lived in Idaho for eight days. Yeah, right? I've lived in... uh... (laughs) I've in Spain for a week. I think I go to the grocery store too often. I do on holiday because I tend to go on holiday where it's warm and so you can't buy lots of food at once. You have to yeah, spread it space out. it out or it goes off. Yeah, I think that's what I've just learned about myself. I need to... St- <laughs> I also stay in hostels. Well, not so much now because I'm getting old. But I used to stay in hostels a lot. So yeah, didn't... Because it was cheap. So would go and buy like fresh food, like fresh breakfast and stuff from yeah. like grocery stores. So. so basically we're just cheap. Yeah. And buy from the grocery store instead of eating out when we're abroad yeah i mean when i'm traveling in america i find the nearest target and go there just because i love target and i miss it so much so (laughs) i don't know if that counts because some of them are grocery stores but like (laughs) yeah but yeah really nanjing was like incredible i had a very very blinkered experience and i'm very aware of that Mm -hmm. because you see it differently as an expat oh yeah um and so I obviously saw a lot different aside to it than if I had just been traveling or on holiday and not visiting people. And obviously a very different view of it to how like Chinese people mm-hmm. see their country. But yeah, I loved it. An experience like no other. Yeah, yeah. Being older and having like an actual understand, like, yeah, I was kind of willfully ignorant. I was like, <laughs> I turned 20 when I was there. Uh-huh. So I was kind of willfully ignorant about what the country is actually like and being a bit older, I'm like, I probably won't go there again. Yeah. But you no, know, it was it was an experience that I loved. Yeah. But yeah. So Nanjing, southern capital. An hour on the bullet train away from Shanghai. Mm-hmm. So it's a very different land 
sort of geographically. Yeah. To when you think of China's borders today, that goes obviously goes right down to the China uh, South China Sea. Mm-hmm. Whereas your southern capital in Nan- Nanjing is actually kind of more inland, halfway up the eastern coast. Yeah. Yeah, different borders. A lot of expansion yeah. in the last uh, how many thousands of years? Two thousand years. <laughs> Uh, although the Han Dynasty ruled from Chang'an, Chang'an at the time of Pengli's birth, it is possible that he wasn't born there or lived there as his father was exiled from the imperial court in 144 BC. Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh, when his father died, Pengli's grandmother was heartbroken and grieved greatly for her son's death. So to console and placate his mother, the emperor, Pengli's uncle, took the kingdom of Liang in central China, which uh, Pengli's father had been the prince of, and split it into five smaller provinces. Uh, The provinces were then given to Pengli and his four brothers. Now, according to Historian's Hut, which is a great name, I love it. Yeah. Liang had been one of the most powerful kingdoms during this point in Chinese history, but due to the falling out between the brothers, uh, the emperor and the prince, the splitting up of the Liang kingdom also served as a way for the emperor to diminish his brother's legacy and weaken his nephew's powers, which is rude. Liu Pengli took control of the newly formed province, or principality as some sources describe it, of Zhidong and became known as King of Zhidong in uh, 144 BC. Uh, before he took power in Jidong, Liu Pengli had a pretty good reputation when it came to crime and violence, even by ancient standards. As in, like, he didn't do them much, yeah. right? <laughs> Quite a peaceful, yeah. peaceful um, aristocrat. Always what you want to find. So the upper echelons of ancient Chinese society were reportedly pretty similar to those of like ancient Roman society and pretty much every other society and civilization. Our patrons may remember our Ancient Serial Killers episode about Lacusta of Gaul and ancient Rome and the general culture of murder and political assassination going on in Rome at that time. For everyone else, uh, during this time period, murder was pretty commonplace and those in power regularly had their political rivals or threats to their power assassinated. Yeah. To the point that in the case of Lacusta of Gaul and that time period in ancient Rome, she was the imperial poisoner. She was like on retainer yeah. to the imperial court to poison people they didn't like. She had a permanent contract. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, Emperor Nero, Nero who had her on retainer. And it seems that the culture in China was pretty similar. While the rulers may not have carried out the murders themselves, their hands were definitely stained with blood. Uh, when he came to power, Pengli didn't have any kind of reputation as a ruthless or bloodthirsty ruler. He was known to be arrogant and aloof, sometimes even uncouth and unsophisticated, but not violent. But, as it so often does, power changed him. You know, they say absolute power corrupts absolutely. Okay, I never heard that before. (laughs) Um, So many of the details are lost to time, as they so often are in these ancient cases. And particularly so in this one, because uh, we've, we've come to a point where we've got a sometime during this 30 year period sort of situation happening (laughs) which is not specific um no but i mean we're 30 so it's like saying sometime in our lifetime yeah that's a that's a big big chunk of time so yeah but you know this is really old so what are you gonna do uh in the years following his uh appointment as king of zhidong pengli began his killing spree uh, however, unlike many other rulers of this period around the world, Pengli wasn't killing to eliminate his enemies or further his political ambitions. Instead, he went around killing at random and hunting for sport. And if that wasn't bad enough, because it's really bad, yeah. he also became something of a cult leader. We're just combining all of our past themes here, aren't we? We are. Love it. 
in in the shortest episode we will ever release. Yeah. <laughs> it could have been this short all along. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so he became kind of like a cult leader, recruiting a group of 20 to 30 followers who accompanied him on his killing sprees. Just what you want. A, a, a band of marauding murderers led by royalty. Not good. You know what the aristocracy go up to. It's not good. So the group would set out under the cover of darkness, traveling through Zhidong, finding random victims to rob and murder. And for a long time, they got away with it. Uh, the murders throughout the kingdom didn't go unnoticed, and they created a fear... Nope. <laughs> a fear of climate. No, that's what we have now. Yeah, they weren't worried about that yet. <laughs> oh, Christ. Okay. But it did create a climate of fear throughout the land. Uh, people were afraid to go out at night, and they barricaded themselves in their homes. And Pengli and his cult became something of a uh, boogeyman story for residents in the province. Rumors began to spread throughout Zhidong that Pengli was responsible for the murders, but with no evidence, there was little they could do. He was, after all, the nephew of the Chinese Emperor Jing. And when Jing died, he was succeeded by his son Wu. Uh, who's Pengli's cousin. So again, the common folk of Zhidong felt there was nothing they could do. But as the rumours began to spread, officials began to hear them and actually have to take note, <laughs> not turn a blind eye or a deaf ear. Yeah. But just like the rest of the province, they wondered what they could do to stop a Pengli's murderous rampage. Do something, y'all. <laughs> uh, now this rampage lasted for 29 years. But in the year 116 BC, he was finally stopped. Uh, an anonymous letter was sent to Emperor Wu by the son of one of Pengli's victims in uh, 116 BC, claiming that he had been murdering his subjects without just cause or due process. The emperor launched an investigation into his cousin and found that throughout his reign, Pengli had been raiding and murdering throughout Zhidong, hunting people for sport, and watching his accomplices kill people for his own pleasure. Despite discovering that Pengli had murdered more than a hundred people during his reign, Emperor Wu spared his cousin's life. Pengli was stripped of his title, all his property and land, which were returned to the emperor, and he was banished to the county of Zhushan in central China to live out the rest of his life as a pauper. I think it's pretty lenient. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and that is the story of the world's first recorded serial killer, Lou Pengley. Boom. In and out in under 15 minutes. <laughs> that's how little wow, that's... information there is on this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what is really interesting about this case is that when you type in ancient serial killers to Google... This guy is, like, the guy at the top of all the lists. Mm. And yet there is so little actual, like, in-depth information about him and his crimes. Yeah. I mean, he just sounds like he sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. I mean, it, it is very difficult to justify murder. Yeah, usually. Other than self-defense. Yeah. I've seen, like, the, the story of Lacusta with... Uh, Julia Agrippina and Nero, mm -hmm. you kind of got the political, it's political assassinations, it's all about power, and it's not justified, it doesn't make it right, but there's a solid reasoning and thought process behind it. Yes, yeah. What makes this so much worse, or seem so much worse, is that there's no, there's no reason, it's, it, it's hunting people for sport. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just like cruelty and arrogance um yeah it kind of reminds me of the like Gilles de Ray story um mm. that we did on on Patreon a little while ago that like he was just a a wealthy guy i mean kind of there were some debt issues involved with that <laughs> and some some poor financial choices but like just a upper class guy who loved killing children yeah. And this is an, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
a man in a position of extreme power, he's a king of a, a whole mm -hmm. like region who just is going to use that power to do whatever the fuck he wants. And mm -hmm. that's terrifying. Yeah. I also think it comes back to that thing of, you know, like what's trashy if you're poor and classy if you're rich. <laughs> Murder. <laughs> and it's like in sort of in these ancient sort of civilizations and even more modern royal families, you know, it's fully accepted that people are assassinated for political reasons. Yes. And because of power and politics, nothing is done about it. Yeah. But it's just it an accepted part of life we know it happens yeah yeah i don't i don't have a whole lot to say about that like i wish there was more information about this out there yeah because i like it's horrible but it is interesting because mm. i don't think i've really heard about like you said the a lot of the other like ancient serial killers that we've seen in like governments or like um royal families have been about politics have been about like shifting power and this is just mm -hmm. like not that so i think that part of it is yeah. interesting yeah even to go back to like the the border reavers uh -huh. and our old favorite from last halloween uh sonny bean sonny bean even they had like a political vent to them mm -hmm. yeah that's true so yeah this this is just one bad dude yeah who decided, hey, I'm just going to go hunt my people now. Mm. It's very um, the most dangerous game. Yes, I still haven't read that. I know we were talking about it a while ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to read it. It's a, good, uh, it's a good one. Yeah, and the fact that he became like kind of like a cult leader and just had to, you know, these acolytes who would also go around killing. Yeah. Really? Yes. Really? Let's maybe, let's maybe don't. Don't do that. It's like the ni Knights of the Round Table, but like evil. Yeah. But like, think of other cult leaders who we know went out and committed murders. They didn't get away with it for that long. No. <laughs> you know, thing. The only one that springs to mind off the top of my head is uh, Charles Manson. That's the one that I thought of too, but also like Manson. Like, he got away with it for, obviously, much longer than he should have. But he mm. he was known to be, like, a freak and an outsider. And, like, you know, mm. nobody in power was taking him seriously. No. And that's, yeah, that's just where you, you always come back to that with this guy. Because it's like, he's in charge. Yeah. He gets to do whatever he wants. You want to, you wanna, like, local government? You want to say stop this guy from murdering his people he's the king he murders you now <laughs> yeah that's it like and it yeah so it really does take like the emperor to come down and say like hmm stop yeah but yeah i don't yeah i don't think he should have just been exiled personally no but then again we know that those in the upper classes aren't punished the same as the rest of us yes that's true on that depressing note. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, yeah. Let us know. The justice system has remained unchanged for 2,000 years. Yeah. It's great. There's no issues. What are you talking about? <laughs> Nothing to see her move along. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Um, yeah, so let us know what you think about Liu Pengli, the oldest that we could find serial killer. Um, we will be back tomorrow with a special bonus episode for all of our patrons and for everyone else. We will be back on Saturday with another special Halloween bonus episode. So see you then. See you then. Bye. Bye.